Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. In our modern Holocene world, the Paleonaths of the Southern Hemisphere are quite the striking group of birds. With most forms being flightless and oftentimes large and even imposing animals, they provide the most obvious reminder of the evolutionary connection between birds and non-avian theropod dinosaurs. The clade is not especially species rich, but are nonetheless widespread with ostriches being the most massive living bird at up to 165 kilograms, while rheas, emus and cassowaries are comparable in size to humans. However, not all paleonaths are either big or flightless, with the kiwis of New Zealand being roughly chicken-sized, while the South American tinamous are still capable of brief yet powerful bursts of flight when threatened. Indeed, these birds are in fact defined by a suite of anatomical traits that are not found in any other group of modern avians, including the possession of a hard inflexible palate in the skull, an unfused ilium and ischium, as well as relatively small brains when compared to other modern bird lineages. Due to these characteristics, as well as their southern hemisphere range, older paleontological studies often considered paleonaths to be relic living fossils being birds with a closer connection to reptiles. Their Gondwanan habitats were thought to demonstrate that these birds originated from flightless ancestors during the early Cretaceous, before the breakup of the southern continents. The flying, fowl-like tinamous were considered to be the most basal paleonaths, with gigantism emerging only once, producing the ostriches, rheas, emus, cassowaries and various large extinct forms. The kiwi then was a strange outlier that developed its small size from more massive ancestors. However, this Gondwanan vicariance theory has been heavily contested in recent years, especially due to the rise of genetic testing, which has shaken up old ideas about the Paleonath family tree. A consensus that has emerged in most of these studies is that ostriches are the most basal living members of the group, followed by the rheas. The tinamous are found to be close to the extinct moas of New Zealand, while the kiwis fall in as the sister group of the massive elephant birds of Madagascar. These results have caused paleontologists to rethink paleonath origins, with it now being proposed that the clade first appeared in the Northern Hemisphere during the late Cretaceous roughly 80 million years ago. Although as yet no Cretaceous paleonaths have been described from definitive remains, the most basal members of the group are the extinct lithornithids which were present in Eurasia and North America from the Paleocene about 62 million years ago until the later Eocene, roughly 40 million years ago. I will discuss more concerning these interesting birds in a minute, but for now it is important to note that these were generally modestly sized and were more capable flyers than tinamous, with some species even having feet that enabled them to perch in trees. From animals such as these, which could more easily fly between continents, all other paleonaths developed, with all members more derived than ostriches, emerging from ancestors that migrated into South America, and then on into Antarctica, Australia and Zealandia. The gigantism that modern and extinct forms are famous for developed multiple times, as these birds found themselves in early Cenozoic ecosystems that lacked large mammalian predators or competing herbivores. Kiwis are no longer considered to be island dwarfs, with the discovery of the early Miocene pro at the St. Bathan site in New Zealand, demonstrating that early Kiwi relatives were smaller, leggier, and more generalised, while possibly being flight capable, or at least descended from flying rail-like ancestors relatively recently. As such, basal Kiwi relatives appear to have flown to New Zealand, probably from Australia at some time during the Miocene. Unlike the totally wingless moas, which are thought to have been present in Zealandia since at least the early Eocene. The closest living relatives of kiwis are the Australian emus and cassowaries, while the extinct elephant birds of Madagascar were even closer, suggesting that they too evolved from small flying Australian ancestors that crossed the Indian Ocean by island hopping. Due to the very sparse nature of Australia's fossil record before the late Oligocene, it is totally understandable that these putative kiwi elephant bird ancestors have not yet been found. 
This leaves the African ostrich as something of an outlier to the rest, as it is not native to former Western Gondwana, an issue that we will now explore in more detail. As noted earlier, the most basal paleonaths so far known are the Lithornithids of Paleocene and Eocene Eurasia and North America. These birds have been known to science for at least 200 years, and were quite common members of the avifauna that inhabited the hothouse world of Paleogene Laurasia. Most forms superficially resembled modern tinamous, and were indeed once thought to be close relatives of them, but this is no longer accepted today. Lithornithids were generally modest in size, especially when compared to ostriches or emus, and seemed to have been well adapted for generalist insectivorous habits, but would not have passed up on berries, seeds, or even small vertebrates when given the opportunity. They appear to have spent much of their time foraging on the ground, with it being found that lithornithids possess vibrotactile bill tip organs like living probing birds such as ibises and shorebirds. In addition, their beaks were quite kinetic in nature, which probably allowed these animals to poke their mouths into tight or narrow spaces in order to better reach their food. Their olfactory lobes were also large, indicating that lithornithids were probably nocturnal, forest-dwelling birds. The namesake of the group, Lithornis itself, dwelt in what was now Northern Europe and the United States during the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. At least six species are known, with the genus being about the size of a large rail. It would have dwelt in tropical and subtropical closed forests, where it would have foraged for food with its probing pointed beak. If disturbed by a predator, it could easily take off to find safety in the trees, with its reversed hallux allowing it to perch on branches. Its wing bones are similar to those of storks and vultures, which means that Lithornis was capable of soaring flight, as was the smaller German Paleocene genus Fischer avis. The very well-preserved genus Calciavis, from the famous Eocene Green River Formation of Wyoming, was comparable to the modern American King Rail in terms of size. Complete fossils of this genus show that it possessed large primary feathers, lacked a tail fan like other lithornithids, and would have been darkly coloured with a shiny, iridescent coat. The largest known lithornithid was the turkey-sized genus Paracathartes, which was also native to early Eocene Wyoming, which would have been more terrestrial and a poorer flyer than other members of the group. Also during the early Eocene, we find the earliest traces of the clade to which ostriches belong, the Struthioniforms. Although modern ostriches are strongly associated with Africa, the broader group to which they belong originated in the Northern Hemisphere, with the most basal representative so far known being the genus Paleotis and its close relative Galigeranoides. The former was a flightless terrestrial bird about the size of a large chicken, which was native to what is now Central Europe during the Eocene. It would have resembled the Lithornithids in appearance, with a slender beak and proportionally large wings, with the living animal being a leaf litter forager that fed on insects and invertebrates. Galigeranoides of France was probably very similar, but is known from substantially more scrappy fossil remains. Another group of early Struthioniforms were the fairly obscure Geranoidids from the early to middle Eocene of North America, about which I can find little information, apart from the fact they were leggy terrestrial and flightless animals that were once thought to be Gruiforms, the lineage that includes cranes, rails, trumpeters and their relatives. In a similar position were the Eogruids, a group of fairly large terrestrial birds that lived in Asia from the late Eocene to the Pliocene, dying out by around 5 million years ago. Remains of Eogruids are quite fragmentary, and are represented mostly by hind limb elements, which show that these were long-legged, fast-running birds that inhabited open plains and scrubland. Some later forms show a reduction of the second toe on each foot, which led to some early researchers suggesting a close relationship with ostriches, which famously have two-toed feet. However, it was generally thought that this was a result of convergent evolution towards a cursorial niche, with eogruids being placed as relatives of cranes. Recent discoveries have overturned this idea, with a partial eogruid skull from the late Eocene showing strong similarities to both ostriches and in particular the older Struthioniform Paleotis, suggesting that eogruids would have been somewhat bustard-like omnivores, that it foraged for insects, seeds, fruit, and small vertebrates on the savannas of Central Asia. It has also been suggested that the larger, younger, and more derived eogruids, which are sometimes known as Erligornithes, 
are actually closer to ostriches and may form their own family. If this is true, then the lineage that directly led to living ostriches evolved in Central Asia before later migrating into Africa during the Miocene. True ostriches are members of the family Struthionidae, the oldest known remains of which are from the early Miocene of Africa circa 23 million years ago. Indeed, the modern genus Struthio is relatively ancient, with the first representative, S. Copensi, appearing about 21 million years ago in what is now Namibia. With their large size, speed and flexible feeding habits, members of Struthio soon spread out across the savannas of Miocene Africa and found conditions to be just as positive in Eurasia, where several species are known starting in the second half of the Miocene. During this time, much of Eurasia consisted of warm open savanna and scrubland, being ideal habitats for ostriches. Therefore, we know of species such as S. orlovi from the late Miocene of Moldavia, S. brachydactylus of Pliocene Ukraine, and S. wimani from the Pliocene of China and Mongolia. From such stock arose the enormous genus Pachystruthio, which was found across Eurasia from the late Pliocene to the Middle Pleistocene, and possibly later, with fossils being uncovered in Hungary, Greece, the Crimean region, Georgia and China. Similar to modern ostriches but much larger, Pachystruthio stood up to 3.5 metres or 11.5 feet tall, and weighed about 450 kilograms or 990 pounds. Given its size, this genus would have been significantly slower than its modern cousins, but despite this was clearly a successful animal with a wide range. This counters older ideas that large flightless birds only emerged and thrived in insular contexts, where mammalian predators were either rare or absent, as Pachystruthio lived alongside a variety of saber-toothed cats, bears, canids and hyenas. This genus died out as Eurasia began to cool during the Middle Pleistocene, with its favoured savanna environment slowly vanishing to be replaced by open steppe grassland. Members of Struthio proper were also present in Eurasia at this time and were better able to survive these changes. Indeed, the species Struthio andersoni, also known as the East Asian ostrich, persisted into the late Pleistocene in China and Mongolia and has recently been reclassified as a member of Pachystruthio, although this result has only been found in one study. It was also significantly larger than the modern African ostrich, being about twice the weight at up to 270 kilograms or about 500 pounds. The finding of eggshell fragments in northern China and Mongolia may suggest that this animal persisted into the early Holocene, with radiometric dates as young as 8,900 years old. The location of these eggshells indicate that these ostriches favoured warm, dry steppe environments, and likely became extinct due to a changing climate and human expansion in the region. Other extinct species that were definitely members of Struthio include S. asiaticus, which was native to India during the late Pleistocene, and the modern S. camelus syriacus, which was present across the Arabian Peninsula, the Levant and former Mesopotamia. This species was hunted to extinction by the mid-20th century, and was slightly smaller than the African populations of S. camelus. The only ostriches that survive today are the two African species, the well-known Struthio camelus and the Somali ostrich, Struthio molybdophanes. The former is found across most of Africa's savannas, deserts and scrubland, being primarily grazing animals that will occasionally supplement their diet with insects, seeds and small vertebrates. Despite popular myth, ostriches are not cowardly animals that bury their heads in the sand when in danger, instead fleeing from a variety of predators including lions, cheetahs, leopards, hyenas and humans. If cornered or defending their chicks, however, ostriches are capable of aggressively striking back by delivering slashing kicks that can kill cheetahs, hyenas and even lions, with humans standing little chance of avoiding disembowelment. The Somali ostrich is native to the Horn of Africa region, particularly in Ethiopia, Somalia, Djibouti and Kenya. Having diverged from other members of Struthio between 3.6 and 4.1 million years ago, this animal can be differentiated by its preference for more heavily wooded savannah, its mostly browsing diet, and, most strikingly, by the bluish necks of males in contrast to the pink coloration of S. camelus. This becomes bright blue during the breeding season, as males compete for the attention of females. The Somali ostrich is considered vulnerable in the wild due to unrestricted hunting and habitat loss, 
while the more widespread S. camelus is rated as of least concern. Although, despite large captive populations, their wild ranges are still declining due to climatic changes and clashes with humans. Hopefully, these majestic animals, the largest birds on Earth, will be able to survive into the future and will not succumb to extinction as did their distant cousins in Madagascar and New Zealand. Thanks for watching, everyone. The next episode will be covering the fascinating South American notoungulates. So until then, I'll see you again soon. Cheerio.